Hi, this is Mark Kep with CampgroundViews.com here in Nevada City, California with two of my favorite park operators. As I'll show you in a bit, Aaron is the queen of social media <laughs> marketing and absolutely kills it. So we're going to have a great conversation here to help you figure out how to use social media to get people into your park. So first off, thank you, Dan and Aaron, for being here with me today. Thanks, Mark. And Welcome if you um, can, go ahead and introduce the park and talk about what you've created here. You can start. So, yeah, I mean, we're the in-town campground, as you mentioned, and um, we built it from the ground up, opened two years ago in July. So it was really uh, an evolving process, which I imagine most parks are. We had lived overseas in New Zealand and uh, done a lot of camping there with our kids. Wanted to kind of experience or bring that experience to Nevada City. The idea of going to a holiday park that was centrally located, had a lot of great family amenities, um, a range of accommodations, um, but then kind of Americanize it in a way that brought kind of the awesome outdoor camping experience that most people expect here um, with those amenities. So that evolved into what we now have, which is the in-town campground in this beautiful property. And it was kind of a stroke of luck, I guess, that we were able to do it. So, so. when you, I didn't know that, but so you brought a European concept here because there's a lot of talk in the RV industry about how Europeans seem to be ahead or more modern or more techs, you know, whatever. And yeah. you, you kind of are a little bit ahead of the trend. So tell me a little bit more about that. Um, you know, it, well, it was New Zealand, but it is a very European experience as well. And it, it just made a lot of sense to us. It wasn't specifically with the idea of attracting a foreign market. It was really the idea that this is such an easy and kind of modern way to approach staying outdoors that um, it made a lot of sense to us in knowing what the environment in Nevada City was like and knowing what an awesome outdoor experience the city itself could offer um, it seemed like a natural synergy so for us it was almost a no-brainer you know I say that now but of course finding the right property and in, in the right environment and the right municipality willing to do it all those things took a lot of time and effort but so can you talk yeah. about that that process in itself when because so you didn't own the property before you decided to do this you actually shopped around and found it and mm -hmm. created it. uh yeah it's sort of shopped around it was kind of a an idea that we like i said we had had in the back of our head for a long time and i remember one day i was actually riding my bike and we passed another property it was just over the hill here and um, I came back, and I think it was either Aaron's mother or, or Aaron. I said, hey, I think I found the property. And she kind of was like, what property? <laughs> <laughs> I said, for the campground. And um, we put an offer in on it, and it was declined, flat out declined, which was probably the most fortunate real estate experience we ever had because um, it opened a conversation with some folks at the city mm. about some other properties in town. And in that conversation... Um, they mentioned the owners of the current property that we have, and he said, I think they might be willing to sell it. So it wasn't on the market. Um, it was basically unused, and because of the zoning, it basically had no future as a commercial enterprise except oh, wow. for some recreational kind of use. And, you know, one conversation led to another, and uh, the owners were like, yeah, we're willing to sell it. So we bought it. And it was, you know, a risk because of the zoning and there's lots of other interesting features on the property that we had to kind of work our way through. But yeah, that's why I say it was kind of fortuitous that the mm. whole thing happened because I don't think if we had been out shopping, um, we would have ever come across a piece of land like this. So that's interesting. So you you had a conversation with the city. You know, I know we get a lot of questions about that. Yeah. Do, do I talk to the city or not? But it sounds like you were very open with them with the idea and the concept and I guess if they had said, no, we don't want it, you would have known right away that you would have had a lot of pushback anyway, so... Yeah, I mean, it helped. So, I mean, the backstory to that is at the time, and actually still, I was on and am on the planning commission in town, so I knew a lot of the city's staff. Aaron's mom had been on the planning commission before, and knowing the people to talk to makes a big difference. Knowing a little bit about what the zoning is and the uses that you can do on various pieces of land makes a big difference. Um, but having said that, you know, it's like any marketing pitch. You need to go in with a good idea and a good story and how it's going to be mutually beneficial. So when I went to the city and talked to them about what I wanted to do, you know, there's a little head scratching going, I'm not sure I understand. But as the conversations carried on, they started to get it. And one of the first things we did, and this was, I mean, not even a, a year into it, maybe. The photo shoot? Yes. Yeah, we did it months. and it was in April. So it was 
a little over six months after we had purchased the property, but we hadn't gotten the use permit yet. So we were still, he was still in his researching and preparing the paperwork for his use permit approval. Um, yeah, but we set up an entire mock camp so that the city could see what was going to be there. We ordered one of our glamping tents early. We brought out an RV. We set up a bunch of tents and we said, okay, this is what we're trying to do. This is what it's going to look wow. like. This is how, you know, people are going to interact with the space and interact with the city. You know, and then I did a bunch of homework. You know, my application for the use permit was probably 150 pages long. Oh. And that was all sorts of specialist reports and, you know, data on the site, data on the industry and, you know, density of campsites, all this other stuff that we put into it. So you're basically selling them on the concept. And, yeah. and as a result of that, did you find that once they went through that process that, that not only did they agree to it, but they were kind of on board with you? Like, hey, this, is, this thing's awesome. Yeah, by the time we went to... So the process here in Nevada City, you go through um, a first public hearing, which is called an advisory review committee. And so what that specifically looks at is like the environmental impact of okay. the project, right? And um, my goal was in pro providing my application or report was to have answered every question that they could have had about the environmental impact of my project. So, wow. um, you know, we'd had wildlife biologists out, we've had an archaeologist out here, we had um, geotech engineers out and mine specialists out because this used to be an old gold mine. So when I handed it all in and, and the city planner was preparing all of the information for this report, I wanted her to be able to confidently say that either there was going to be no environmental impact, which is like not going to happen, <laughs> right? Or to do, which is the preferable option, a mitigated negative declaration, it's called, which basically says, yeah, there's going to be impacts, but they've already addressed those impacts by virtue of how they're going to build it or how they're going to operate it. So, okay. you know, all of that was in the application. So that when we go to this advisory review, um, we had no opposition to the project in town. Wow. And uh, we went through that smooth sailing. We went then a month later to the regular public hearing at the Planning Commission, and that um, also was no opposition in town. And, I mean, we're a small town. There's always opposition. And it's something. California. I mean, mm -hmm. it's shocking because I know there's, there's actually a number of RV park projects, not just in California, but across the country right now. And what will happen is they'll go to Planning Commission Committee, and there'll be 10 or 15 angry neighbors who show yeah. up and talk about, oh, they don't want a trailer park next to them. They don't want this. And, I mean, it sounds like if they went your route, they could potentially have mitigated all of that before they even got to that point. Yeah, and, I mean, you have to, as a as a developer, I guess, not that I particularly like that word because it has a lot of negative connotations in situations like this, um, but you have to be willing to understand and listen to what the concerns are. So as we were developing this you know, application, it was a year. I mean, from when we bought the property to when we got the permit, the use permit, okay. not even building permits. And there was a lot of conversations. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I went to city hall and just sat down with the planner or the city engineer or the city manager and just talked about what we were doing and what, you know, what issues they were seeing and how they would kind of affect the city and, you know, what impact maybe the neighbors would have. We went to all our neighbors and talked to them directly so, again, all that information gets incorporated into my application so that there aren't any, like, bogeymen that I don't know of. And if there were some, which, of course, there were concerns, you know, I've addressed them by that stage. Wow. So Talk about the design and layout of the, of the property and, and the idea for the glamping tents and how that all kind of played into your planning. Um, so the design and layout was uh, dictated entirely by the site. You know, the previous use of the site, it was, I mean, the history is it was BLM land until 1996. So we're technically the second owners of this dirt. <laughs> um, prior to that, there were two gold mines on the property. One was a placer mine, so hydraulic, and then the other were hard rock mines. And then the previous owners, once they bought it from BLM, they put in this kind of novelty train ride mm. that went around the entire place. And we kind of... You know, given that it's a forested site and it's fairly hilly, we didn't really want to go too extreme when it came to grading or, or even to tree removal. So we used basically that track that they had as the main foundation for our roads. Hmm. You know, we had to widen it and things like that. But we started there and then we just kind of worked out and then we kind of had some philosophical discussions about what we wanted the campground to look like, how would it fit within this environment, you know, are there any cool trees that we want to particularly make sure we save, 
you know, are there some duds that we need to make sure we get out before they're full of people? Hmm. Um, like duds being dangerous or dangerous not, or yeah. not healthy, something yeah. like that, you know? Um, but I think it's useful to say that we have the combination of regular tent sites, we have RV sites, and then we have the glamping sites. And we yeah. wanted them all to have, the, we told a lot of people that we wanted it to feel like a state park, but have all the amenities of a private campground. So with that mindset, we went about designing the campground yeah. so that they would have all the different types of camping, but they're thought out in terms of where they're located and what the camping experience feels like for all of those campers. And so that was all very conscientious. Yeah. I mean, a lot of RV parks, you know, the tenting, for example, can be kind of an afterthought. Yeah. It might just be like a little square grass over on the side or gravel in some cases. You know, we wanted tenters to feel like they actually had a home, you know, mm-hmm. that they could come here and feel kind of in a natural environment. You know, one of the interesting things that we experienced is, you know, you get all these engineers and designers involved in a project like this. And um, we've got this cool civil engineer, a good friend of mine from Cub Scouts, and he kind of drew it all up and, and we got it all finally approved. But then the other flip side to that is we had a cool local family who did all the infrastructure work for us. Hmm. So things change as you're building, you know, and they really understand quote unquote the dirt in this county and they've been working it for a long long time so as we were building it you know they would come up with suggestions be like you know it's not going to work here the dirt is really hard or it's particularly clay let's try doing x y and z hmm. and we would change that and probably the best example of that would be the glamping tents where we put those okay they were originally intended to be kind of in our middle loop that we call the gloop and um <laughs> As we were building it, we realized, well, one, we couldn't fit the RV sites in that we wanted because it was too much of an impact into the hillside and it just didn't work. So we thought, okay, if we can't fit the RVs there, then, you know, we need to push them out. So let's find some flat dirt for them, which ended up being where the glamping was going to be. And and then it was like, well, why don't we just put them out over the edge, overlooking this drainage? Yeah. And it was one of those aha moments where you're like, wow. That's a way better view. <laughs> yeah, because you have the patios out on the glamping tents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so let's go to talking about the glamping tents themselves because that's a definitely a unique aspect. You were early on to the glamping trend, <laughs> right? And it, we'll talk the glamping tents themselves. So they're not something you bought, right? Uh, they're a hybrid. I mean, obviously we had somebody make them. Right. You know, we used a company in Denver. and um, But it was again a back and forth dialogue about what we were looking for what size we wanted and you know where you want to place windows and how you want to do doors and things like that so it very much at that stage was um, a custom design okay you know and you're ordering them all at the same time so we didn't get something stock off the shelf they were really good about working with us on that Mm -hmm. front Um, all the design and interior stuff was much more Aaron and yeah. And her mom, for sure. You know, my my job was to get the thing built, give them a platform and a blank canvas, literally, and, you know, make it look pretty. Yeah. And that was their job. <laughs> well, and so that goes to the first time I ever heard of in-town campground was through, because Aaron handles the social media stuff, yes. right? Was through some of the social media posts. And I'm thinking, was, were these the images from the pre-staging of the site for the, were those the first images you used for social media? Well, I used some of the photos that we took in that professional photo shoot. Well, when he talked about the staging of it, that was actually the catalyst of that was a photo shoot that we needed or I wanted for uh, marketing (laughs) purposes. Because if you're going to create a website, you have to have something to work with. And since we own the property, it was like, well, this is easy. We'll just just mock up what we're going to build and then use those as marketing material. So my very first post was, this is what we're building. And then, um, but yeah, because it took us a while to build the campground i got to share the process along with yeah. people while we were building it did it, you find that that engaged people yeah yeah and i mean i should probably say that while i was busy doing all of this design and getting the thing built she was very active and just as busy you know setting up the whole idea and selling the image of what it's going to be i mean yeah. one of the things that is, i don't maybe we didn't appreciate or didn't understand is you know, how are you conveying to people something that doesn't exist, you know? And it's such a visual experience, and it's a very tactile experience when you go camping. You know, you can smell the trees and feel the pine cones under your feet and all those things. 
how do you sell that when it doesn't exist yet? So hmm. she, I mean, it's very natural for her to understand that. And she knew, and as much as I'd be groaned having to take photos, you know, here and there, it's like, <laughs> I can, honey, I'm putting an RV pedestal, so, you know. <laughs> I can imagine the conversations now. Uh, you know, we're speaking to other park owners, and they're probably the same way. You know, it's a husband and wife team yeah. or a family team, and one person does one thing, and there's those little battles going on. Uh, not really battles, you know, it's working with each other right to, to sure you know, each one has their own goals and own specialty and and being able to work together is kind of a key to actually pull something like this off oh it's an, and we yeah, also yeah. recognize that there's no way that we could have had a, a successful start to the business if we hadn't had a separation of those responsibilities because he literally was putting in the electrical work on the glamping tents on the day we opened like it was very much a all hands on deck to the last possible minute and yeah. but we had we opened july 1st so we, we were crazy and opened on a holiday weekend yeah it was fourth of july weekend <laughs> and so it was like and we had i mean not 100 percent full but we were almost full so your opening weekend you're almost sold out yeah, yes i think it was well over 80 percent. yeah it was crazy to have no dry run no practice nothing and we're like okay here we go and I mean, oh man, it was it was nerve wracking to put it mildly. But the reason we were able to do that is that I had spent years cultivating that what we're doing and and what what we want to do. I like to tell the story about it, the person who was our very first online booking. So we released the bookings in March before we opened in July, and I sent her a message because she'd been super excited about. I had said we're gonna release the reservations probably next week, and she planned her summer vacations on our social media channel. I was like, this person is legit. <laughs> and so then when I finally released them, I sent her a message. I said, I still have some back end stuff. It'll probably be an hour at least until I announce this but in the meantime you can actually go online and book and so while I'm doing my website stuff um, she goes and she books her two summer dates so she's reservation number one and reservation number two (laughs) and when I see her in real life that first month of our open for business I was like oh my god did I live up to your expectations and her response was perfect she was like yes so much more and I was like why did you give us your money we like no one had ever stayed here and she's like you've done such a good job of showing us what it was going to be and now that i'm here it's so much more wow so that's beautiful actually it's a cool story yeah and they've been back since they that first time so in addition to being like legit diehard fans they're also now repeat fans so let's do okay so let's dive into that now and talk about the marketing the social media aspect of it because like i said that's how i originally discovered you and you remember i when i reached out to you i think the first thing i said to you is Hi, my name is Mark with Campground Views, and I love what you're doing with social media. You've blown me away. <laughs> Tell me how you've done this. And so, you know, a lot of parks, they struggle with social media. They don't, they don't either know how to do it right or they don't feel like they're reaching people. And it was interesting. You just mentioned you had spent years building this up. And so that's one misperception about all marketing is that, oh, I'm doing it today. It should work tomorrow, right. and it takes time. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we've met customers even like the people who started stayed in our Riverside Retro, we have now have an RV that we rent out to customers. And the very first customer who stayed in it was like, I've been following you along for years. And he retold me a story about us testing the roads with the fire department. <laughs> yeah. wow. And I was like, that's yeah. like years. Like that's a pre-opening story. I'm like, he really has been following us for three years since I told that story. So, and here he is now being a paying customer. So, um, yeah, I think it's important to have the long view. Yeah. And also, I mean, the, the engaged community is a great asset as well. Yeah. Even if they're not paying customers today, hopefully they'll think about it or refer you or you know, keep us in mind. So your location here also plays an impact in that, right? Because Nevada City, California, so most people would think Nevada City's in Nevada. It's actually in <laughs> California. It's on the west side of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. You're about, what are we, like two and a half hours from San Francisco? If there's no traffic. Yeah, traffic, depending. Yeah. And then how far from Sacramento then? An hour. hour. So you're, you're three, two and a half hours from Many. eight million people? Yeah, we have a, cat, a huge catchment. Yeah. For sure. So... But- But we found that people actually come from even closer. Like, they're coming from Auburn, Roseville, Rockland, Chico, Reno. I mean... Yeah, hour to hour and a half is the predominant... Of where people are coming to you from. people are coming from, yeah. And did you do any other marketing other than the social media as you built up to opening the park? I think... Um, Not not paid marketing. We we did hire a publicist, which was hugely important because she had great contacts. And so we were able to get in, you know, lots of magazines and blogs and, and things like that, which obviously increases your exposure. 
in a huge way. <laughs> but not just magazines. I mean, where, what are some of the magazines you've been in? <laughs> Honey. Yeah, I mean, we've been in Sunset a couple of times. Um, last summer, we had the honor of being in the Southwest Airlines summer issue. But also, we're in the Air- Alaska Airlines issue. Um, I feel like some of the other online ones, like we've been in the Chronicle. We've been in... Um, Forbes. We've been in... Yeah, Forbes yeah, Online. Forbes Online. There's... It, there's a few of them. I mean, so, I mean, Sunset's a big one because, yeah. you know, for us, that is, is pretty much on the pulse of the kind of market that we were going for. Yeah. So to be able to get that exposure is huge. And, yeah. And, um, I mean, it's it's basically invaluable. So another park operator saying, how can I reproduce that? Because really, as you're saying that, I'm thinking yeah. it really comes into everything you've said from the beginning. You built to that point. I mean, it's not like all of a sudden you said, oh, we want to be in Sunset Magazine. How do we how do we set ourselves up to that? You designed this park around a certain audience, a certain message, mm. a certain experience, and you've built on that and stuck to it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, that's... Yeah, people ask that question a lot, and it's really hard to answer because, I mean... Me, personally, I'm a very intuitive decision maker. So, you know, I'll be walking around the camp even now, and we were just discussing a a new option that we're thinking about bringing in, and and it's like, well, what's my gut tell me? You know, does it feel right for who we're trying to attract? And um, I wish I could give some sort of, like, clear metric that you could do to get to that. But, I mean, it's every campground's different, and finding the right market for the right property in the right town, you know, it, that's why I say it was serendipity, man. It's, I don't know if I could ever replicate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, who is your market? Are you going after yourself? Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. we talk about how we built a campground that we would like. So then we're like, well, if it's something that we are interested in, then, then that's probably a good pulse. But I mean, I think the advantage of having a campground that has tent sites, glamping sites and RV sites is that we get other people that aren't necessarily our demographic you know they don't have to be a family with kids they could be yeah. retirees they could be full-timers they could be budget-minded travelers with their friends it could be a girls weekend you know it could be it could be and then what we love is when we get all of the above and they come together because we offer the different variety of camping options in one location so we'll get one unit doing this and one doing another and and that's a really fun thing for us to be able to say you could have all of them yeah. And I, I mean, I might just add to what she said there because, and you talked about the longevity and, yeah. and the investment and time you have in developing marketing and really getting into kind of a market's visibility. Um, you know, for her, it comes natural. And so when there's other operators out there that struggle with social media, it's like, I, I don't do it. You know, I mean, and it's not because I don't enjoy it, but it's because it's not for me it doesn't bring me as much joy for her. I mean, she could be sitting on the couch at home and she's just got a smile on her face and I'll say, what are you doing? And she's like, Oh, somebody just commented on, you know, my picture (laughs) and she gets joy out of that. So for her, it's like this, this online way of, of connecting with your people, you know? And, and I was talking with the staff over the weekend about it and how, you know, one of the things that we often hear from our customers when they come here is they love the sense of community and we had a group over Memorial Day weekend and they didn't tell us they were coming as a group they all booked individually and this was all like last September you know so a good nine months ahead of time and they must have been half the campground they were 20 families 20 families from Orinda Orinda. and there were 82 children on site which for us is a lot of people I mean we're not that big of a park and the parents, it was so funny because, you know, it's basketball season, right? So the parents were all off in the commons. I set up the projector to watch the, the Warriors game. And so they were all in there having their cocktails. And there were these packs of kids going around <laughs> camp. And we were talking to the staff. And, and I was like, these kids never get to go and just run around. No. They don't get to be, like, off the leash, so to speak, without their parents. And so having these community spaces where the parents could be, where the, the kids could be, and seeing them experience that I was like you know the reason people like coming here and I'm sure other places is because there's a sense of community that they don't find in their own life and and it's not necessarily just because it's with their friends it's because of the environment that they can be in and so being back on social media you're connecting into the wider world with this community that you know when we were kids probably was just our neighborhood 
but now that doesn't exist in the same way that it did. Hmm. So your neighborhood is now online. Interesting. You know, you can have a barbecue by taking a picture of it and posting it on Instagram and sharing that experience with the people who you know are going to appreciate that experience. So that's actually a very good example. And very So how people could do the social media and, and take a picture. So on that picture of the barbecue, what would you post with that? What would your text have been? At the, for yeah. here, yeah. I would ask, what are you having for your dinner? Because I feel like part of social media is to be social. So you should engage with the customers or the other people who are interested. So, uh, you know, or what's your favorite barbecue food? And, and I'm amazed by the number of suggestions and ideas. Like our customers have got great feedback to us. So uh, I feel like we're actively engaging in a conversation. Yeah, that, the that conversation. The it's, you know, when, when you're marketing, you're like, oh, I want... I want my customers to appreciate what we have to offer. But really what you're doing with social media is you're acknowledging and appreciating who your customers are just as much as you're selling them on something. It's like, hey, you know, look at our barbecue. We're having this. But more importantly, what are you having? That's huge. You know, and that's a huge piece of advice. And we get people that come in and I mean, we get repeat customers a lot now and just knowing their story you know where are you from what do you do you know how's the rig treating you you know yeah. the slide out fix you know <laughs> whatever it is just and those are the things i think a lot of operators can relate to and probably do natively very well and social media is just another platform to check in with them and and just say hey you know what we care huh so time wise yeah. how much time are you spending on average <laughs> that would be doing this most. yeah i spend a lot of time i mean we also own another business the motel and i write a local blog for the motel, which is a, definitely a time-intensive project. Um, I don't usually quantify because I feel like that scares most average okay. people. But it is a large component of my job, and I take it seriously. And um, I think the best advice for people who are like, how much do I need to do? I'm like, you need to consistently do whatever that is. Yeah. If that's a weekly or if that's daily or if that's monthly, it doesn't matter as long as it's consistently the same. Not... 10 things in April when you have the time and then 10 things in December when you have the time. So, um, Yeah, you're better off picking once a week, you know, or once a month even if you're going to do a blog than one in January and another one in August and another one in September, you know, the ambiguity. Because it's like any marketing strategy. You're, you're going about brand consistency and awareness, right? So the more you're connecting with your market uh, and the more regularly you do that, then the more awareness they're going to have of your operation. And so they're going to be more likely to come back or think of you when they're thinking, oh, yeah, we'd like to get away for the weekend. Where are we going to go? So let me go through a few digital <laughs> marketing things, and you can say yes or no <laughs> on them. So boosting a post. I don't boost very many posts. Email marketing. I'm working on improving. Okay. <laughs> so we, we did... The short answer is no, we don't. No, really we haven't that. done. Yeah. I mean, the uh, the blog, both blogs for both businesses have an email subscription. So if you subscribe to the blogs, you would get the email when okay. I post something new, which is a good, useful tool. People do read them. Yeah. Um, but, but we don't do a blast. Okay. We're working on it. We're working on it. How many blog posts do you do on a monthly basis? For the campground business, I do it monthly. And for the outside in the motel, I do it weekly. Okay. How about pay-per-click ads on Google? I have very little. Good Sam. No. Uh, what else is out there? You did you do the PR stuff. You mm -hmm. still do the PR stuff. I now. do. I still do the PR okay. stuff. I mean, we we tried Yelp for six months. Uh, you know, as paid Yelp ads, and we didn't notice any appreciable. How about TripAdvisor? I mean, we have an active presence. I, it's always enter, it's worthy of continuing to revisit whether or not it's worth the money. I, I'd be interested in uh, the other people in this uh, your listenership if they have had direct sales from that. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in knowing more. And we have a special arrangement. We were You were one of the first parks that let us do the 360 video <laughs> for, for the park, right? And you used that and took it to an event, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we had the 360 video. Um, and then you do pictures. I mean, with social media, you're creating all this content yourself. So, yeah. I mean, you're. do you know how many pictures you've posted over time? Have you ever looked oh, at that number? Man. No, but, I mean, I think it's... It's difficult to put it into the perspective because yeah. I have, once again, a local blog that I have written for the motel, which I've been doing for seven and a half years. So you get time. And I, for before we opened the campground, I published two to three times a week. 
And so, like, when people ask, well, how many pictures do I have? All of my pictures fall, you know, work-related pictures fall yeah. under that sort of category. And it's, you know, close to 20,000. Okay. So if you're like, I need a picture of this, I probably have it. And that just cause, comes from years of consistently creating more content. But I love taking pictures here. It's, like, one of my favorite things to do, just to go around. Well, it's a beautiful property. Yeah. It's so much inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, so let's go on to the pictures themselves. So... For the vast majority of park operators, when I look at their social media posts, they're different than yours. So can you talk a little bit about what you're, you're speaking to your guests, you're engaging with them, but your, your photographs are different. So a lot of parks, they'll take pictures of, you know, like their Halloween um, event and they have pictures of the individual people and they'll have like 500 pictures of people that were during that event. Whereas your pictures are more, I want to say like inspirational, aspirational you know, they, they, they create this image of beauty and all that type of stuff. Can you talk about your creative vision behind your photos? That's a good question. I mean, I think it comes back from the part about having done a blog where you're using the stories to tell a story. You're using the pictures to tell a story. And so I have that as like a common denominator in all the pictures that I'm taking. Like, how is this photo going to represent what I want it to tell? Um, I mean, I always tell her that, you know, her photos or, or the idea behind the photos is to give somebody the vision for what it's like to be there you know to, it's like an enticement almost where you're, you're kind of like I can go back to the barbecue picture right I can smell that hamburger right now because it looks so juicy and beautiful right yeah <laughs> and when people start thinking about that they start visualizing themselves in that environment and I mean we're all as campground owners selling some little sliver of paradise every time somebody comes to our park right so you know how do you put a sliver of paradise into a picture and some of it's just creative talent having the eye for it which she has clearly um but another part of that is the technical side i mean she spends hours editing her photos now granted you don't have to take as many photos as she takes (laughs) Um, but she has a good camera and she, she uses Lightroom for it. And so she has, over time, taken those photos and really understands what you need to do to make them look the way... To make them pop. To make them pop. You yeah. know, because, let's face it, not everybody takes a perfect picture every yeah. time they do it. You know, you could have a cloud coming through, any number of different factors. Hmm. Um, but being able to edit the photos and, you know, really capture what it's like is something that you just have to... I think do over time. I think you know, if also, you look back at your photos from yeah, you first, also have to be able to edit them. So I look at back at the original stuff and like then I don't know if I would post some of the original content I did hmm. to begin with. So I feel like with time, but I feel like the best advice you could give to a park owner who is looking to up their social media game is to hire a professional. Like they don't have not everyone has to have those skills. Like you yeah. could just as easily invest a few hundred dollars or more than that in someone to come and be like take some lifestyle photos, take some pictures of our campground in people using it and then use that content Um, and that was when our original photo shoot my mom was like why are you going to pay someone when you can take plenty of good (laughs) pictures and I'm like I can't orchestrate all the vision that I want and all the moving pieces because we had so many different setups and get all the things that I need in the time frame so I'll orchestrate it all with the vision and I'll hire the photographer who I liked his work and I'll get him to take it and it was great it was such a good investment to have those high quality images of and we brought it to life so it wasn't it wasn't it was all intentional yeah you know it's actually that's the same advice I give folks when they're thinking about doing this especially if they've like bought a new park or they're trying to they're trying to say what's wrong with my park that's my advice I say hire somebody and, and I give them these two pieces of advice I say hire somebody and tell them to take pictures of your park and make it look and not make it look good but just show the park as it is mm. do that as your first project because what's going to happen is you're going to look at those pictures and go why is that trash can there what is this thing you're yeah. going to notice because you might you'll be standing in your property and you don't see it because you're so used to it but the second you're handed a photo of it it's like wait a second that doesn't look right so then fix those little things and then step two would be Go back to that same person and say, okay, for an extra 200 bucks, come back out and make our park look good, but also, would you say, realistic, too, so you're not misleading them, oh, and so yeah. it looks like it is. Yeah. Fundamentally, and that, even when we did our mock-up photo shoot at the beginning, you know, before we opened, that was the number one thing that we always talked about is, yes, we're selling something, but it has to be authentic. 
you know, not only in what we're representing, but in what their experience is going to be. It has to be something that they can feel confident when they come to us that they are going to experience the campground in the same way that we experience the campground yeah. kind of on a daily basis. Which I think so. goes back to the, the super fan who booked the first reservation that she was willing to give us her money because she felt like she had a good understanding of what we were selling. And then when I asked her in real life, like, did we do a good job of living up to those expectations? Yeah. And she said, yes. So in that regard, then that's a good reaffirmation that we're on the right path. Yeah. And was we, she an RV or tent or a glamper? A glamper. A glamper. So let's go to the glamp. I want to, I want to, <laughs> and people are seeing this glamping tent behind you and they're, they're asking yeah. about that. So can you go, because the RV camping space is going straight up. I mean, RV sales are going to hit another record this year. So everybody's thinking RV, RV, RV. But you've got something unique here with glamping, and you're hitting a totally different audience. Maybe the same audience, I don't know. But the glamping tents, can you talk a little bit about that and how that came about and what that market's like? I mean, well, it came about actually as a, an evolution or a manifestation of this idea of the holiday parks because, you know, before we moved back from New Zealand, we took our two boys who were two and a half and five at the time you know, on a road trip for two and a half months. Um, but there was always a range of accommodation at these places. You know, they might have a little motel unit. Some of them had little caravans you could rent um, or just a regular old tent site slash RV. They didn't really separate the two. Um, so when we came back and we're like, how do you translate that model? You know, at that stage, glamping was still pretty pretty new to the, to the marketplace. And I don't... I mean, I think, you know, what we had done, you know, what we had done is we had stayed at Costa Noa before we moved to New Zealand and Costa Noa has these and has had them for a long, long time. Where's Costa Noa? It's, um, just South of Half Moon Bay, between Half Moon Bay and Santa, Santa Cruz. Cruz. On the coast. Okay. On, the coast. Yeah. on the coast of California. Yeah. Okay. okay. California coast. And they've got, um, a KOA RV park there. Okay. They've got a conference center with some motel units and then they've got, um, these glamping tents. And we had stayed there, geez, it was a long time ago, you know, probably 14 or 15 years ago. And we're like, whoa, this is kind of cool. So we thought, well, maybe we could then kind of modify that a little and bring it back. The idea really was to provide that range of accommodation, though. Um, not be too RV-centric, not be too tenting-specific, you know, but then give something for everybody. And it's turned out that there's actually a lot of mixed groups out there. And so if we could do anything differently it would be to f create more clusters of these spaces where you get the groups who are like yeah mom and dad have an rv we're coming in the glamping tent and then hmm. you know my sister she's you know cheap or she just likes sleeping in the tent whatever it is yeah you know but we do get a lot of mixed groups in that regard so i think it was just kind of an untapped market yeah. that there are people who actually love being outside that really don't want to hassle you know, with the RV. Now, the other part of that is we're, of course, close to the Bay Area, so there's lots of people who live in the city and have no place for an RV. Right, right. <laughs> or maybe not even place for tenting gear. So right. um, that might contribute to it, partially, so the, too. Inside of the clinic, there is a bed. I mean, it's not a, they're not sleeping in a, on a sleeping bag or anything like this. So there's a bed. There's actually furniture in there. Mm -hmm. Running water? No, no. running water. Um, some places do that, you know, the permitting around that is entirely different. So we didn't go that route. Um, but you know, we don't get too much feedback. We did have one lady who said, well, do you think next time you could put a bathroom in there? Well, we own a motel, so, so we, we have a great recommendation if you need a bathroom in your <laughs> yeah. room. Um, but there are some cool places, you know, Safari West down in, uh, Santa Rosa, they have some with bathrooms in there. So that's pretty cool. Um, so, actually, that's interesting. So, you know, because our focus is obviously campgrounds and RV parks, but you're not only looking at campgrounds and RV parks, but you're also looking at some of these <clears> in these glamping destinations. And, and those are different, right? I yeah. mean, their, their price points are, I mean, compared to a campground, they're way some higher. of them are way, way higher. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it's a totally different experience, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, because we own the motel before doing this business, we really came at the business from the accommodation, hospitality mindset, not from the RV park owner mindset. In fact, we had a lot of learning to do in terms of the RV park mentality. Um, so that probably contributed a lot to how we came up with this vision or how it evolved, I guess. Um, but I spend as much time giving feedback from hotels when I travel about our operation as I do from campgrounds. Huh. So, 
you know, what's this hotel doing? How does that work? What's their resort feel like? You know, do we want that kind of feel? What kind of amenities do they have? You know, operationally, how are they dealing with certain things? Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, we'll go to RV parks and there aren't a lot of direct translations to what we do here. You know, it can be hard to get direct market comparison. Um, but, you know, we go to the Arvik shows and yeah. talk to people, and that's been really helpful for us. Do you find now that you've been open for about two years that people are coming to you and, and checking out your property to copy or imitate? Um, there are a lot more glamping places now. Popping up. There's a yeah. lot more popping up. It's, you know, but it, and this is the one thing I, I caution people when they do ask me about it, and they do tend to ask me at the, the shows or the conferences. Um, it you can't do it in isolation you know it's kind of like you're talking about social media and and how you could just do it and it would happen well you know a glamping tent just plopped up isn't going to have necessarily the whole package right you really have to think about it strategically in what you're trying to offer your guests because if it doesn't fit into some greater strategic vision for your park it it's going to kind of fall flat hmm. you know people don't just want a tent you know they they want an experience so what experience are you going to provide them or do you provide them and how do you fit glamping into that niche or maybe it doesn't fit you know yeah, interesting. probably lots of parks where maybe it's not the right fit okay yeah and so nevada city itself is a unique destination in and of itself i mean you've got uh, you know uh this area obviously was the foundation of california because you have the gold mining here and so you got that history but the nevada city is a bit quirky it's a, it's got a <laughs> unique vibe to it so that kind of fits into your your target and your location itself sure. so what is the experience you're creating here what is what is if you could sum that up what is your experience i think that it's great that you can be a mile walking distance to a historic downtown charming little you know, foothill town, but still feel like you're camping in the woods. I mean, we have over 2,000 trees on our campground, and so we give them a taste of outdoors. But then we have beautiful, clean bathrooms and a swimming pool and a camp store that sells craft beer and a communal living room where they can watch the basketball game. So you're not really roughing it in a way that people, yeah. You know. I mean, if I tagline and it, it's like providing an opportunity for people to get it in the woods without any hassle you know, to kind of like open the door to the outdoors again, because for a lot of folks, it's not easy to do. Or, if, you know, where we are in California with 40 million other people, even when you do get outside, there's a gajillion other people there. So having the accessibility to the amenities in the town and kind of the environment all in one package is really appealing to people. Um, but if I'm going to say what the experience is, I'll go back to last weekend or Memorial Day weekend where you get kids running around barefoot playing with pine cones and sticks. For a kid from the South Bay or from San Francisco or Oakland, that doesn't happen. And yeah. so we're selling a completely different version of reality for some of these people. And... I mean, it's like they soak it up, and you can see them. We talk about this all the time on Friday. You know, they've been fighting traffic on I-80 for like six hours, and they show up, and they're just strung out. And, and then they'll come in, and they're they're kind of like tweaking about it. And, and then they'll come in, and the guys will see, wow, you guys have good beer. <laughs> and then the mom will be like, is that wine in a can? You know. And by Saturday morning, though, we get them settled in, they're relaxed, and it's like, the weight of the world is off their shoulders and it, it's amazing the transformation so understanding and appreciating that life is busy and stressful and you know we have that too right yeah. we're a family we've got two businesses all the rest of it but understanding the experience that they're going through to get here and then when they get here and realizing that it's easy and that if they forgot something, it's not the end of the world. That they don't have to worry about their kid going to the bathroom and like not touching the seat, you know, <laughs> or, or falling in. You know, we've all been there. Um, those things have an immense impact on our customers. We've discovered, and you know, intuitively, again, the intuition. Like I knew it was important because I'd been traveling with my two and a half year old kid, and you know, you're like hold them over the bathroom yeah right you don't want to do that and so i tell staff every single one that comes on board you have to be willing to clean a bathroom and you have to be willing to pick up trash if you're not 
you know, this isn't the right place for you. Yeah. Because those are important things to people. And obviously you got to be friendly and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. <laughs> well, I think that our staff also appreciates that how much we care and having had the, all this time and energy and we won't even talk about the money, but into invested into this project and they can see that it's something that we're really passionate about. So, I mean, I think that would be other good advice to other park owners if they get a new park, like show their staff how much they care, you know, how much yeah. they're investing in their time and their energy and their resources into making this the best that they can. So yeah. that has a lot of value too. It's an interesting point because you're, I mean, two of you have created this, but you're not doing it alone. You, no. You recognize it and you couldn't do it alone. No, 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 no. no. And, um, you know, you can't do it. One, you can't do it without the incredible staff who believe in what you're trying to do now we were lucky because you know we've got great staff that have been with us from the get-go and you know they help build this business so they're emotionally invested in what the product is as much as we are um you know and then but the flip side to that and i had a conversation at one of the calarvic um, events once with a guy and he was talking about why we opened the campground um, but he kept coming back to his spreadsheet you know, and, and it's like, well, what what's the percent return that's going to be on? And I was like, well, uh, there aren't any other campgrounds like ours that we've been able to find, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, which yeah. is scary. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but I told him flat out. I said, look, man, if all you're into this for is the money, you are in the wrong business. Wrong business. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I bet every one of you guys out there would say the same thing. You know, can they be good businesses? Absolutely, and they should be good businesses. Yeah. Um, but if you're not going into it with a passion for being in the industry you know whether you're more on the camping side or more on the rv side whatever your niche is you shouldn't do it because that passion is what people thrive on you know we've got a picture above the um the desk in the office that's got aaron and i from one of these photo shoots and the number of times i'm sitting there checking somebody in they go like that's you. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> or, hey, that's her. Yeah. And I'll say, yep, that's us. Because they think it's like we're just modeling. It's like, no, this is who we are, you know? And so whoever's out there is operating a place, be who you are and love what you're doing. Because if you don't, first of all, you got to ask why you're doing it. I mean, anybody can get a job that they're ho-hum about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you might as well enjoy what you're doing you're going to get in this business. It's a very good point. I could talk to you two all day long. So I, love, I, love I know. Does anyone want to listen? I don't, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out if they turn off after five minutes. But is there one last thing that you could leave other park operators with that if you had known this piece of advice before you started, it could have made a, a world of difference or not? Is there something you could leave them with? Um, I mean, I think we, you just So, did, yeah, we talk about it. Um, be authentic. You know, because people really can see through the things. You know, if you're having a bad day, just acknowledge it and tell your tell your customers. It's like, yeah, something didn't go right, and you'd be amazed at how many people empathize with you because they're just people. You know, they appreciate that you've taken the risk in opening a business and that you're providing them with this awesome place to be. And um, the more authentic you are with them, the more likely they are to appreciate your business as an asset to their vacation or whatever they might be doing. So that's my one piece of advice. Yeah, I would say, you know, the consistency and engagement and that that is really, I mean, I don't necessarily know all there is to know. And I'm sure there are other campground owners out there or managers or operators that are doing other things better than I am, but I'm willing to learn and try. And I feel like that probably is. <laughs> is You're willing to fail. Yeah. Well, and we, I mean, we talk about the first, our first season, we numbered all our tent sites in the wrong order and had to redo our whole map and all of our reservations. Because when you think about it, we're like, what were we thinking? Anyway, <laughs> it, it's fine. We were wrong and we renumbered them all. Um, but I feel like that's, that's probably it, just to show up and to, you know, start a dialogue and, and learn from the conversation along the way. Wow, very good. Well, if you've enjoyed this, go ahead and comment below and obviously reach out to In Town Campground if you have any other questions. I'm Mark Kep with campgroundviews.com. Thank you and goodbye.